بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. First of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to tonight's lecture at Dar al-Athar al-Islamiyah's 22nd Diverse Cultural Program. And um, I would like to um, extend this opportunity to mention that we have a second um, unprogrammed lecture for tomorrow, uh, sorry, next week, uh, that is scheduled, uh, not scheduled in the program, uh, just in case any of you were wondering if this was the last in the series. Over the course of our cultural program and through a series of outstanding lectures that we've been very fortunate to have here at the Dar al-Athar al-Islamiyah, we've come across many symbols across many different cultures, across many different times. These symbols have traveled through time, through cultures, been translated, retranslated, copied, and also um, adapted by the artisans in various different ways, depending on what cultures they've come from and in various different forms even to the extent of changing their meanings in some cases. Tonight's lecture will closely examine one such motive, and it is titled The Three Hairs, A Cross-Cultural Journey from medieval, um, of a Medieval Motive, presented to us by Dr. Sue Andrew, who we welcome to the DAR for the first time tonight. We are honored to have Dr. Andrew here with us tonight, um, who comes to us all the way from the UK, where she is an independent researcher whose diverse studies at Edinburgh University and Plymouth University have encompassed such varied subjects as sociology, anthropology, comparative religion, art history, and a very interesting study of architectural conservation. Moreover, Dr. Andrew has more recently collaborated with archaeologist T Dr. Tim Greaves and photographer Chris Chapman on the recently published, and they have both recently published an interesting titled book, Three Hairs, A, Curious, a Curiosity Worth Regarding. This book is an accumulation of many years of research during which time she has shared information with and was assisted by academics, curators, collectors across Europe, Kuwait, India, and the USA. Dr. Andrews will shed a light on the transition of a cross-cultural 6th to 8th century motive of the three hairs to the 11th and 13th century Islamic world through beautifully crafted ceramics, glass, textiles, and metalwork and most probably mobile phone covers had there been such things in those days, which is my gentle reminder to silence your phones before we start tonight's um, lecture. One last note before we start the lecture tonight, there will be a Q&A session immediately after the lecture. So if you do have any questions, please note them down for Dr. Andrew. Without further ado, I welcome Dr. Andrew to the stand. Thank you, thank you for that warm introduction. And thank you for your kindness in inviting me to Kuwait and um, for looking after me so well since I've been here. So my lecture tonight, The Three Hairs, The Cross-Cultural Journey of a Medieval Motif. And what I've done, I've extracted this particular design from a piece that's held in the Al Saba collection. And I've extracted it so that you can see the design quite clearly. And it shows three hairs walking in a circle and they share between them the three ears at the center of the design. But it's a puzzle because each beast actually has two ears. And it comes from this wonderful um, lead tray inlaid with brass from the 13th century. 
And um, the design is just a lovely design. I, I, I took the foliage out of it, but when you see it with the foliage, it's just a, a superb design. And it seems to be a particularly good um, thing to start this lecture with, because I think the programme for this cultural season has been to do with blessings and benedictions. And this tray actually carries uh, benedictions glory, prosperity, good fortune, and felicity. And they're repeated on this tray. So it seems to be a particularly apt uh, thing to start the lecture with. And I'll be returning to um, the Islamic world, the art of the Islamic world, a bit later on. But first of all, I'd like really to tell you how it began for me. And it began for me in 1991, which I know was a momentous year for you too. But in 1991, I read an article in a local magazine. It was an article called The Tinner's Rabbits Chasing Hares. And um, it was by the gentleman there with the beard, um, Dr. Tom Greaves. He's an archaeologist and historian. And the image was taken by the, the other gentleman in the picture, Chris Chapman, a photographer. And I was so interested in this particular article. At that time, I was at home, um, a mother of three small boys, and running around in ever-decreasing circles. So somehow, the, the design of the three hairs seemed to be particularly good for me at that moment. Uh, I became very, very interested in it, and I started doing a little bit of research of my own, and sent some details to Tom. And then in the year 2000, we decided to set up something called the Three Hairs Project. And the aim of that was uh, to, to go across wherever we could to, to find this particular motif and to photograph it, to research it where we could, so we could start establishing a picture of, of where these hairs had come from and where they were. But the article was about hairs not in the Islamic world, but about hairs in Devon, in churches in Devon. And uh, for 25 years, we've been doing our research on these hairs in Devon and where else they occur, and then last year, we, we finally got, 25 years after I first read this article, we wrote the book, The Three Hairs, A Curiosity Worth Regarding. And we have um, a piece from the Islamic world on the front cover of that book. But um, this is our, our churches in Devon. This is Widdicombe in the Moor in Devon, a very different landscape from the landscape here. Um, and this church, it's a church that was largely rebuilt in the 15th century. It's sometimes known as the Cathedral of the Moor. Uh, Dartmoor is a, a quite a big area in Devon, and it's marked by hedge-banked fields. Um, this was taken earlier. I took this earlier in the winter. You can still see frost on the fields there, um, and lots of bracken, lots of grazing land, um, and small villages that, that circle around their, their village church, their parish church. And this landscape really hasn't changed a huge amount in hundreds and hundreds of years. And so, as I say, this is, is not that far from where I live, in Dartmoor, in Devon. And we have 16 churches in and around the moor that have the three hairs in them. And they're carved as uh, wooden roof bosses, oak roof bosses, in the, in the roofs of our churches in Devon. Uh, this is a, a, a close-up of Widdicombe Church. You can see a, a big, tall tower there. And here we have the connection that, from that article uh, that Tom had written about the tinners, because the idea was that the tinners gave money for the rebuilding of this church in the 15th century. There was a lot of tin working on Dartmoor during that period. And the idea was that the tinners gave money for the rebuilding of this church. And so, by association, um, it became established that the hares in Devon had some sort of connection with tin, but that's very much a modern myth. Uh, we've, we've got no evidence at all to suggest that in the medieval period there was any connection with the three hares design and the tin working or the tinners that there were on Dartmoor at that time. So it's very much a modern myth that crept up in the 19th and the 20th century. And this is the interior of Widdicombe Church, very different now from the way it would have looked during the medieval period. We're talking about pre-Reformation religion, we're talking about the Catholic religion before the Reformation in the 16th century, when images and um, a lot of the paraphernalia that there was in churches at that time was completely swept away. So this is rather a plain church now in comparison with the way it would have looked uh, in those days when the hares went into position. And the hares, if I can get this to work, the hairs are there in this church. Um, they're a wooden roof boss, an oak roof boss, up in the roof, and they're above the chancel of the church. And the chancel is the most sacred part of the church. The nave, the, 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 the bit further back, 
was the, the preserve of the people of the church, um, but the, the chancel was the preserve of the clergy of the church. It was a very sacred place, and, and that was the clergy paid for what was happening in that part of the church. So that's where the roof boss is. And this is the roof boss. It's an oak roof boss, 15th century, with much, much later modern paintwork, probably 20th century paintwork. And it was probably literally done by a man on a ladder, which explains it, why it's a bit um, not terribly refined, shall we say, just to put it, put it kindly. It's not terribly refined paintwork. Um, but as I say, I think it probably was done by a, by a man on a ladder. But that boss has been in that church when so much else was swept away. The roof boss has survived. And they survived because they were literally tucked up out the way. They couldn't be got at. So that's why they survived when so much else was actually swept away during the Reformation in the 16th century. And this is another roof boss in a, a church in Dartmoor. It's Throwley Church. And here the hairs um, circ circle in a clockwise direction. In most churches in Devon, they, they circle counterclockwise. But here they circle in a clockwise direction. Again, a 15th century boss. And these things are normally no more than about 30 centimeters across, carved in oak, and probably carved by local craftsmen, not by specialist carvers. They were probably literally carved by the people who were working on the roof. Because as you can see, the, the carvings aren't actually that fine. But when you consider that you're looking at them, you're standing beneath them, looking at them from about 20 or even 30 feet down, um, when, when you see them here, they do look a bit, um, perhaps a little bit crude. But when they're up in the roof with a lot of other things happening as well, and you're 20, 20 or 30 feet beneath, um, they, they don't look quite as, as crude as they perhaps look in the images here. And another oak uh, roof boss at South Taunton Church, also in Dartmoor in Devon. And here the, ha the hairs are going counterclockwise. All the images are different. All the carvings are different. We don't think any one of them was carved by the same hand, necessarily. Um, they all put their individual sort of spin on them. And even where you find two bosses of the hairs in the same church, sometimes in the chancel and further back in the nave, they're not normally carved by the same person. They're normally carved by a different uh, different craftsmen who would have carved them. And we have one in Sprayton Church, which is just to the north of Dartmoor, and there's an inscription on the roof timbers there, which probably dates this particular boss to 1451. And you can see there's lots of uh, foliage swirling around the hairs here, which seems to be a common feature. And the inscription was written by Henry Lemain, who was a, a Frenchman, a Breton, um, and he um, was the vicar of this church here in 1451. And he says he wrote the inscription in his own hand. And it may be that he also carved the roof boss. But that gives us as good a date um, as any for these roof bosses. None of them have been dated scientifically. But we think, for the most part, they're 15th century in date. And here's a close-up of that boss. And bear that design in mind with a swirling foliage around it, because we'll see a similar design later on in a very different context. Some of these bosses may have been painted. Um, it's very difficult to tell. Again, they haven't been scientifically studied. This one has certainly been lime washed. But where you find colouring on these bosses now, it's always modern paintwork. It's not old paintwork that you find on them. But they may have been painted originally, but very difficult to tell. Uh, here's another one. Um, not in Devon. We know in the neighbouring counties of um, Cornwall and Dorset and Somerset, we know of one uh, single oak roof boss um, in each of those three counties. Um, so this is the one from Dorset, slightly better painted than some of the others, and actually quite geometrical in, in, um, in its design as well. So we've got these roof bosses in Devon, 16 churches where we have these roof bosses. The neighbouring counties have one roof boss each. Um, and the roof bosses there are not structural. These wooden roof bosses are not structural. They're literally tucked up to cover the joints in the timber roof. They're not structural. But here in St. David's Cathedral in Pembrokeshire in Wales, we have one that is structural. It's in the Lady Chapel, and this is 16th century in date, again with modern paintwork. And this is a, a keystone. It locks the vault into place. And at one stage, it was down at the west end of the Lady Chapel in St. David's Cathedral. It's at the east end now. Uh, and this paintwork dates from the 1970s. And you can see these creatures look a bit beaten, look a, uh, as though they've, um, they've suffered a bit. And in fact, they have. 
um, and we'll just move on to the reason why. Because um, this is the earliest mention that we know of in, uh, in England, in Britain, of the hares. And it says, the roof, curiously arched with stone, but now going to decay apace. In the keystones of the several arches are images, coats of arms, wreaths, and devices. In one keystone near the west end are three rabbits placed triangularly, with the backside of their heads turned inwards, and so contrived that three ears supply the place of six so that every head seems to have its full quota of ears. This is constantly shown to strangers as a curiosity worth regarding. And from that, we took the title of our book. But then it goes on to say, the upper covering of lead was taken off in the rebellion, so that it is feared it will soon break in and fall by the stress of the weather, which is often very tempestuous in these parts. And in fact, it did fall in. I think it was the 18th century it fell in, and it wasn't restored until the early 20th century. And that roof boss fell to the ground. It was probably da well, obviously damaged at that time. It was then built into a wall later on, and it was only at the beginning of the 20th century it was actually put back into the roof of the Lady Chapel in St. David's Cathedral. So that's a, 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 a structural um, uh, three hairs in stone. Uh, further north in Yorkshire, in Selby Abbey in Yorkshire, we have another amazing survivor in this particular boss. Uh, again, oak. Um, gilded and gilded fairly recently, we believe. Um, but you can see that the, there is actually damage to this boss as well. If you, if you look up around uh, the corners, it's clearly been repaired. There's repairs all around here. Because on the 20th of October, 1906, there was a huge fire in Selby Abbey. This boss is, was in the nave roof, and the roof virtually collapsed. The bosses were literally falling off. Fortunately, because they'd been attached by oak pins, the oak pins burned through and the bosses fell to the ground. And so this one was damaged as well, but again has been repaired and put back into position. And again, another survivor from the early 14th century, but this time in a different medium, in um, clay, in a, a clay tile, made probably at the Penn Tilery in Buckinghamshire in the early 14th century, and now in the church at Long Crendon in Buckinghamshire, and the only reason that this has survived, even though it's partial, the only reason it survived is it's set against the altar step. And so all the other tiles that would have had images on them, they've all been worn clean by people's feet walking over them over the years. But because this is set against the altar step, it has survived. And that's what we're talking about. It's a real story of survival in all the different contexts in which you find these hairs. It's absolutely a story of survival. And when I first saw that um, tile in Long Crendon, I felt a bit sad that it was the only one left. So um, I got in touch with this lady, a lady called Diana Hall, who's become a great friend now. And I asked her, I commissioned her to actually make a new three hairs tile of this particular design. And here she is bashing the clay into a mold and then using um, a, a beach stamp to, to um, press down to put the design on. And then she puts a different color, she pours a different color slip, a white slip, over the tile and scrapes it back. And when it's finished and fired, this is what it looks like. So that's what that long Crendon tile would have looked like. And as I say, Diana um, has been making these tiles ever since. And another tile of a different design from Chester Cathedral. This was recovered from the nave of Chester Cathedral and is now in the Grosvenor Museum in Chester. Um, and probably something that would have been part of a much larger design because you can see the foliage here and it would have linked up with other bits of foliage. So this, this part of a much larger design. And the hairs don't really run in their circle so much here. They're sort of squeezed into space, as it were. But they still share these three ears at the centre of the design. And the only one that we know of in medieval stained glass, again, 15th century, and again, an, an amazing survivor because... This originally was probably in the clear story, which is the row of windows that's above the nave in a church. And that was the reason it survived, because it was very, very high up. Because we know um, in the late 15th century, Fermin the Glazer was told to go to Long Melford Church and to smash all the images in the windows, which he did, apart from these ones that were set in the clear story. And they were later brought down. And this is now above the north door, put together with a piece. Uh, it, it didn't uh, it originally, obviously, go with that piece of the sunburst there. But that little fragment of the hairs um, is, is what survives there. But the earliest um, hairs that we know, the earliest uh, 
really records of three hairs, are in decorated uh, manuscripts. And this is an initial from the Grandison Psalter, which we know belonged to the Bishop of Exeter, so it was in Devon in the middle of the 14th century. But it wasn't made for Bishop Grandison. It was made much earlier, well, 1270 to 1280, probably in Chichester in England. But we know it belonged to him, uh, the Bishop of Exeter. He must have purchased it or whatever. Um, it belonged to him, and, and it was in Exeter Cathedral, the, the great cathedral in Devon, uh, in the middle of the 14th century. And uh, it's now in the British Library. And actually, Bishop Grandison must have treasured this book. He must have looked at it on a daily basis. It was his, his own book of Psalms, his Psalter, his book of Psalms. He must have looked at it on a daily basis. And he must have treasured it, because in his will, he leaves it to Isabella, the daughter of the king. So these are the earliest hairs that we know of in Devon um, and in, in manuscript form. And here's a historiated initial from a Psalter around 1220 from England. Um, historiated meaning that it's a, an initial that tells a story. And this is the story of the first temptation of Christ. And here you have the devil throwing stones down in front of Christ um, and, and t telling Christ to turn them into bread. And here, um, up the top in the, in the corner here, you have the three hairs. Within the, the tail of this, this creature, which is a wyvern, a dragon, and dragons at that period were normally associated with the devil. So um, it's a sort of, got a sort of slightly negative feel about it here, or it seems to have a slightly negative feel about it here. Um, but this, this is so interesting because it's the only one that we've, where we've got the hairs in association with another image like this. Um, but in an illuminated manuscript, a bestiary, a book of beasts, which wasn't so much a natural history, a work of natural history as a moralizing uh, tale. Um, the idea was that God had put animals on, on the earth so that man could learn by their behavior how he should behave. And um, these bestiaries were, were very brilliantly illuminated. And this one here, um, 1225 to 1250, has four hairs walking in a circle, sharing four ears at the, at the center of the design. And we find threes and fours um, later on in the art of the Islamic world as well, and I'll be showing some images of, of that a bit later on. But here the bestry um, associates these particular animals in this particular bestry. They have a positive connotation. They're referred to as people who put their trust in the creator and, and who have faith in God. Um, but elsewhere, the hairs carry a, a much more negative meaning. In at least five of other bestiaries that we know about, they carry a much more negative meaning, and they're likened because of their ambiguity, because hairs were believed to be hermaphrodite. They were neither male nor female, or they could be male one year and female the next. Um, and so because of that, because of this ambiguity, they were likened to people who were inconstant and who were unstable, and people who weren't firm in their faith. So trying to actually pin down a meaning, even within a Christian context, is exceedingly difficult because you have hairs that carry positive connotations and you have hairs that carry negative connotations. So very, very difficult to actually say what they, what they meant, how they were understood during the period of time in which they were used. And so I'd like to quote from Professor Paul Hardwick, and um, he says, the hair is both sinner and good Christian, male and female, noble and rogue, natural and unnatural, inhabiting the realms of Christian religion and folklore, to be both hunted and shunned. It is, in short, an animal which is impossible to pin down to a particular signification. And that just sort of backs up what I've said. You know, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. And actually saying exactly how it would have been understood is almost impossible. And these are the, old, the, the hairs at Old Cleve in Somerset, one of the neighboring counties to Devon. The hairs occur um, slightly further afield in a Christian context as well. This is Wissembourg Abbey Church in Alsace in France. And it was a Benedictine abbey. It isn't any, any longer, but it was a Benedictine abbey. And in what was the chapter house of that abbey, you have four bosses, um, some of them uh, certainly one other at least taken from the medieval book of beasts, the bestiary, and then you have the hares as well. And here running above flowers, possibly a fleur-de-lis and, and perhaps a rose and, and perhaps even a harebell, um, a stone roof boss around about 1300, 
in the, what was the chapter house of Wissenburg Abbey Church. And a stone carving 14th to 16th century from the chapel of Notre Dame de Chardonneret at Tielouz in the Vosges in France. And here the hairs juxtaposed with the figure of Christ crucified. So clearly they were significant in some way. But actually saying what that significance was is very, very difficult. And stone tracery from the 16th century, the North Cloister window at Paderborn Cathedral in Germany. And this is an old postcard because this was severely damaged in bombing in 1945. The hairs are now in the museum, damaged though they are, and there's a modern replacement that's been put in. So um, these are hairs that even in, the, even in the 20th century, you know, suffered. Um, and, and as I say, were quite badly damaged. And uh, in, an, in a Christian context, again, at close to Heine, Cistercian Abbey in Germany, on a bronze bell of 1224. And the hairs there occur, they're just at the top there, you can hardly see them, they're just there. And above the hairs, there's an inscription in Latin. And it says, give pardon Christ, the people pray, and so does this sound. And it may have been here that the hairs were used in an apotropaic way. They may have been used when the bells were rung, particularly during thunderstorms, to frighten away the devils, the demons that were thought to inhabit the air during thunderstorms. The hairs may have also had that kind of intent. They may have been there to help ward off evil spirits. But again, you know, that supposition, we just really don't know. It's speculation. But interestingly, um, lots of the other bells in Germany and particularly at close to Heine, were melted down for cannon at various periods of war. But this bell survived, and, it, and we can closely date it to 1224 because it carries several little seals on it, and one of the seals is Archb Arch Archbishop Siegfried II of Mainz. And so we, we know that this bell can be dated to 1224. And a wall painting from Fenis Castle in Aosta in Italy. It's the, 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 the frame for a chapel, and here the hairs occur, I believe, with some animals from Aesop's fables. I haven't been to this, this castle, and uh, somebody sent us this, this image. But as far as I understand, they occur with other animals, some taken from Aesop's fables. So it may have been literally a design that was in a pattern book. That could have been the way that the hares moved around the Christian world in a pattern book. If so, we don't have a pattern book that survives with the three hares um, in a Christian context in in um, our churches in, in Western Europe. But the hairs occur outside um, Christianity as well, as you, as you know. Uh, this is a, a, Hebrew, a Hebrew manuscript, 1309. It's the only three hairs that we know in a Jewish connection. We have a four hairs in a Jewish connection from, from an early period, but this is the only three hairs we know of um, from this Hebrew manuscript in 1309. And this is now in Hamburg. But the three hairs had a post-medieval life in um, Judaism as well. This is a painted ceiling panel of 1738 from Unterlimburg Synagogue, Schwäbisch Hall Museum. It, that's where it is now in Germany. And here again, you've got lots of foliage swirling around the hairs. And, and so 17, this is 1738. And we know that the hairs occurred in, in other synagogues as well. Um, sadly, um, Many of them have, have been lost now. This is a modern replica of a painting of 1729 from Gvorjit Synagogue. Um, and this is now in Warsaw, in the museum in Warsaw. Um, so this is a, a, a painted replica. Fortunately, some good photographs existed of these synagogues. Um, I, think, I believe this synagogue um, went fairly early on in the 20th century, but, but others were lost um, during the period of the Second World War. So we know that, again, you know, some hairs, we've lost some hairs from... from context, Jewish context in particular, uh, in, in the 20th century. So the furthest extent, we've got our hairs in Western Europe now, the furthest east they go is here, or at least as far as we know, this is the furthest east they go, at uh, the Magao Caves at Dunhuang in China, on the edge of the Gobi Desert. And this photograph was taken in 1907 by the explorer Oral Stein, and you can see these, these cave temples and that the cave temples are carved out of a, a conglomerate cliff. It's a, a very long conglomerate cliff. And um, at one stage, there were a thousand um, caves that were carved out of this cliff. 
and uh, some of them have been lost, but many of them survive. And they don't look like that now. This is how they look now, because I think in the 1960s and later, a walkway was built along, and in order to stabilize, because obviously uh, there was a lot of damage that was happening to the paintings, the painted surfaces inside the caves, and so they were stabilized by having these fronts, these concrete fronts uh, put on them. But you can see the cliff, the cliff there behind, and it's an ongoing battle to actually preserve these things. Because, of course, people want to go and see them, and with people, when people go and see them, they bring damp, and, and um, just going into the caves, you know, there's wind-blown sand, and there's light, and, and everything there, which affects them. So it's, the conservation of these caves is a, is a really um, key issue. But the interesting thing is that in 16 cave temples, the same as we've got in our churches in Devon, 16 cave temples, you find images of the three hares. And uh, the, the temples are just absolutely amazing. Uh, sometimes known as the Caves of the Thousand Buddhas because of this little Buddha device that is painted um, all over the caves on the walls and sometimes on the ceilings as well. And it's a slightly coffered ceiling. This is a sort of well that... that um, goes up, and here you can see the hairs just at the center of the design, inside a double lotus. And these are apsaras, uh, flying sort of angel-type, um, that, that, that sort of swirl around there. But the paintings are just um, so fresh. If you stand beneath, beneath this and look up, it still looks so, so fresh. But this cave dates from the Sui Dynasty, 581 to 618. Uh, cave 407, and that's the earliest period that the, at the cave temples in Magao, the hares ran on from the Sui dynasty through to the late Tang. So from 581 right through to 907, the hares appeared in caves throughout that period of time. And this is a close-up of that. Um, you can see the double lotus here quite, quite well. But what's really interesting here um, is that these, ca uh, these, these hares here run in a counterclockwise direction. And in, most, in, in all the other caves, they run in a clockwise direction, but here they're counterclockwise. And you can also see that round their necks, there are little tiny ribbons that trail out behind. And this is something that you often find in the art of the Sasanian world. Um, you find that, that kind of, that, those ribbons, those little um, ribbons that, that, that flow out behind, um, and you find it on ducks, and you find it on other animals as well in the art of the Sasanian world. And we know that there are influences from the Sasanian world, from, from um, that empire that, that ruled the Eastern Iranian world, well, actually expanded. Um, we know that uh, there are other influences in the caves there. But again, very difficult to pin down where, where these hairs came from. And when we were out in China, we went out in 2004 and spoke at a conference there. And when we were out there, we were very fortunate to meet up with somebody called Professor Guan Yu Hui, who had worked for 50 years for the Dunhuang Institute. And he said he didn't think that the hares were Chinese in origin, even though this is the earliest mention of the hares, uh, 581 to 618, that's the earliest mention. He didn't think they were Chinese in origin. He thought they'd come from what he called um, the Eastern Iranian world, the Persian world, and that they'd gone probably to central t China, where they'd, be, where they'd been adopted and adapted, and then moved back um, across to the, the caves at Magao. And we said to him, well, why are there no more hares other than in Magao? And he said, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. You know, it's just a little motif. Um, so much has been lost. Um, but he said he was quite, quite specific that he didn't think that the, that the hares were Chinese in origin. He thought they came from, from what he called the Persian world. And this is another cave, uh, Lake Tang, Cave 139, and it's a tiny little cave. It's a, a meditation cave, and it's only big enough for one man to go in and, and, and sit in, in meditation um, under, underneath this, this um, painted ceiling. And these, I think the pearls as well, I think that's a sort of um, Eastern Iranian, uh, although they, they occur in lots of different contexts as well. Um, but certainly this, this painting um, is very, very fresh. It, it's a, a cave that is not visited by the general public, and um, we had to ask repeatedly, and eventually they let us see it. Um, and then much, much later on, they provided these photographs for us. And, and in fact, when we did our book, this was the first time that, the image, uh, that this image had actually appeared anywhere um, of this cave 139. And here are the hairs. Uh, 
Um, a terracotta plaque from the Swat Valley in Pakistan, 9th to 11th century, a very mysterious piece. It was recovered uh, possibly um, from what it was a small square building that may have been a fire temple, but so little is known about this piece. It may have been a votive offering, um, it may have been part of decoration. Again, not enough is known about it or its context to establish really any, anything more about it than that. But in fact, are these hares here? Are they hares or could they be deer? Um, because in a Buddhist context, um, deer were very important as well. So uh, difficult to know whether they're hares or whether they're deer. Um, certainly at Magau, we think that the hares had a positive connotation. And um, Professor Guan Yo Hui said he thought that they might represent tranquility and peace. Um, they occur within the center of a lotus more often than not, which is associated with rebirth. Um, again, nothing written down to tell us what, what they could have meant to the people that were looking at them all those years ago. And another um, place where you find the hares at Alchi in Ladakh. And these um, images uh, by Yaroslav Ponkar, um, absolutely stunning, stunning images, the Indus there. And then this little temple complex um, just underneath these huge, you know, the Himalaya there. Just absolutely, just wonderful little temple complex there. And this is the Sumpsek, the, um, one of the temples in, in Alchi. And inside the Sumpsek, very plain on the outside, but highly, highly decorated on the inside. Uh, an enormous statue of the Buddha of the future, the Maitreya, the Buddha of the future, around about 1,200. And you'll see he's wearing a long dhoti. And on that dhoti are painted roundels with scenes from his life. And in between each of the scenes, uh, you can see the scenes here, the uh, image of the dhoti there. In between each of these scenes, you find these little um, medallions, if you want to call them that, um, of animals that run in a circle, most, mostly in a clockwise direction, sharing ears at the center of the design. And the, the, the creatures here have been referred to as bulls or as leaping deer. Um, I like to think they're a variation on the theme of the hares. And I suspect they may well have been intended to be hares uh, because there are paintings elsewhere at Alchi in the Great Stupa as well. And here you see threes and fours um, alongside each other. There's a three here and, and a four here. Uh, and they do look a bit more like leaping hares rather than bull, particularly here look more like hares than, than bulls or, or deer up there. So this is 1,200 um, from Alchi in Ladakh. So on to the art of the Islamic world. I suspect that textile may well have been the medium by which the hares were transferred. Textile or perhaps metalwork from um, east, well, from, from the west, really, effectively from the west, from the eastern Iranian world, east to China, and then back across to, to Western Europe. And what I've done here is, is, is taken this um, roundel so you can see the image slightly more clearly. It's this roundel here. And this is um, a detail of a cloth of gold with rabbit wheels, 1225 to 1250, the same period of time as that medieval bestiary image I showed you earlier on with the four hairs sharing four ears. Um, from the Eastern Iranian world, uh, and what was bought by the Cleveland Museum of Art um, in the 1990s, I think. And I actually spoke to the dealer who, who um, sold it to them. And she said it had come, well, she, I think she purchased it in Hong Kong. And she thought it may have come from a Tibetan monastery, but she couldn't be sure. But, um, but I do think that it was certainly uh, highly, highly crafted, highly accomplished works from the Islamic world that allowed the transmission of this, this hair's design from, from the east to the west. And here's a map um, showing uh, our, our three hairs, obviously in, in Britain, and then this cluster in France and Germany. And it is only a cluster. The cluster in France is in eastern France. Um, and then there's, there's a lot of area where the hairs don't occur. Um, and then right across, there's Dunhuang across here, there's Alchi there, and there's Barakot, Pakistan here. But as I say, it's the art of the Islamic world that was the key to the transmission of this design. And very early on, we had both ends of the picture, but we didn't have the, 
the dots that join. We didn't have the things that, that, that brought the whole picture together, that com completed the picture as much as we ever can complete it. Um, this is the earliest uh, it, case that we know of where um, the art of one culture is, is um, in, another, in, another, in, a, in a work by another culture as well. And so where the hairs sort of really come, become cross-cultural. And this is the Meccana ceiling um, in the Capella Palatino in Palermo in Sicily. And I know Dalu Jones came and she spoke, I think, earlier this season about uh, the Capella Palatina. And Professor Jeremy Johns has been uh, and spoken here as well about the Capella Palatina. And it's a marvellous, marvellous place. Not that I've been there, I hasten to add. It's on my list of things to do. But I really would love to go there because it's where all these cultures come together. The Greek culture, the Latins and, and the Arab culture come together in this one building, in the decoration of this one building. And you've got this amazing ceiling, um, a ceiling made by craftsmen, by Muslim craftsmen. And there's some debate about where they came from. Professor Jeremy Johns, I think, believes they came from Fatimid Egypt, whereas Dalu Jones, I think, believes that they came from, uh, that they were a local workshop, Muslim craftsmen, but a local work, workshop in Sicily. But um, Professor Johns, as I say, seems to think that they, they came from um, Old Cairo, Fustat Old Cairo. Uh, and, and that's what we've sort of, that's the information we've included in our book. But a, a wonderful, wonderful ceiling, a coffered ceiling. And um, here you have the hairs in this cross-cultural context in 1140. And yet they retain their identity because it's still an Islamic ceiling. It's still the work of Muslim craftsmen. But um, it, it's there with all these other influences as well. Uh, so it's a real, a real treasure trove of all these different uh, cultures. And it can't be seen from the floor. It's quite badly damaged. But you can still see that it's three hairs, and you can still see their three ear, the, the three ears that they share at the center of the design. And um, a glazed pottery bowl, which I think has just entered the Al Saba collection very, very recently. And I was sent a picture of it even after we, we published our book. So um, the middle of 2016, the, the, the image arrived with me. And a glazed pottery bowl, 10th to the 11th century from the Eastern Iranian world again, and here in the collection. And I think it awaits sensitive con uh, conservation as far as I understand it. But here the hairs with fish, which may be sturgeon. So that adds another little um, puzzle to our, to our already puzzling motif. And a tile, which I saw today, and it was just so lovely to see it in the flesh, as it were. A tile with traces of yellow glaze, Second half of the 12th century from the Eastern Iranian world. And um, it's in the little children's exhibition um, he here in Kuwait. So really lovely, lovely to see this. And it's nice, you know, hexagonal tile um, that, that sort of follows the idea that, um, that there are three ears, but each animal has two. So there's that nice, there's that nice sort of doubling aspect of it. And the doubling aspect actually may be something to do, it may be that one of the reasons why the hair was used. I don't know if you have that in your traditions here, but certainly the, the idea um, over in Britain is that the hair doubles when it's trying to escape. It's referred to as doubling. It twists and winds in order to escape, and that's referred to as doubling. Um, so it may be that that at one stage was also part of the, of the way that this motif could have been understood. But as I say, whether that goes cross-culturally, that idea goes cross-culturally or not, I don't know. And a four hairs, a purse, a leather purse. Um, I just really wanted to include this because it's just so striking and, and such a very, very unusual thing to have survived. Late 12th, early 13th century would have been carried, I believe, on a belt and in the collection here. And again, I just darkened these hairs down so that you could see the design more clearly. But really spirited animals here. And just so that the, the design just flows around. It's just such a lovely, lovely design. And a brass tray from the late 12th or early 13th century and from the Keir collection. And it was in Surrey when, I, when we, we went to photograph this. It was in Surrey, belonging to Mr. Edmund Unger. 
Um, and he has since died, and it's now, I think, in Houston, or it's certainly, certainly somewhere in America. Um, and here are the hairs with these. Uh, now, I'm not sure what you call them, but whether, I've heard that they're, re they're referred to, they could be referred to as sun's rays or rays or as tassels. So again, you know, it's, it's how you interpret these things. But the three, here, the three hairs here again at the center of the design circling. And an inscription that runs around this, this uh, bowl as well, referring to happiness and blessings. So another, um, the hairs seem to have a positive connotation um, in the art of the Islamic world. Um, having said that, Hairs could also be used to, apparently devils or demons and jinns used to run away from them because um, hares were known, or rabbits were known to menstruate and they didn't clean themselves afterwards. And because of that, jinns or demons would flee from them. So again, it might be to do with that, that here, that they were representing good fortune and good luck because they were keeping the bad, the bad side of things away. An Ilkhanid copper coin from 1281-1282 uh, um, from Urmia um, in, in Iran. And on the obverse, uh, there's a, an inscription that refers to um, the Ilkhan, who was Abaka, who ruled from 1265 um, to 1282. And it also refers to the Great Khan, who was Kublai Khan in China at that time. But in the, um, in the margins here, apparently, is the Shahada. So it's a coin that has quite a lot of significance in the Islamic world. Um, on, the, on the reverse, you have the, the hairs here with that foliage. And if you think back to that roof boss at Sprayton with the, the um, curling or the, the, the scrolling foliage, very much like the design that you find on this uh, copper coin. And although we know that the, the hairs were cross-cultural before the Mongol Empire, we think that the, the Mongol Empire may have, have certainly aided the transmission of the design because as nomadic people, they were very keen on portable objects um, that of a very high status, like silks woven with gold, like um, extravagant, expensive metalwork that was easily portable and could be transported around. And we also know that because the Mongols were, were so feared, and because we know that whole cities were raised, if they refused to submit, that, that whole cities would be raised, people obviously fled as, as they came. And so that enabled um, cross-cultural transmission because people had to move. But even when cities were conquered, we know that the Mongols actually moved craftsmen. They spared craftsmen and move, would move them to wherever else in their empire that they saw fit, wherever they could best use them. So we think that the Mongol Empire was probably one of the reasons that um, the design, that the tr transmission of the design happened in the way it did. And of course, there were tremendously stable trade routes at that time as well, for, for at least a hundred year period. Um, as long as you had the right, the right passes, you could get from one end of the empire to the other end of the empire without any problems. Um, and so that's why we think that this, this um, provided a good time for the hares to actually move around as they did. Actually, I should have said, I'll go back to that one, because um, the, the hairs on this particular coin, uh, there's a numismatist who's looked at it, and a, a chap called Dr. Lutz Illich, and he suggests here that the hairs were almost used to um, support the heavenly mandate of the Mongol rulers, because hairs often had a lunar connection and you will find other coins with ravens on, sun ravens, uh, and, and uh, these could be lunar hares, and that they supported the heavenly mandate of the Mongol rulers. But another wonderful, wonderful piece, um, and I, I'm eternally grateful, actually, to the Al Sabah collection for helping us um, determine some, some information about this particular piece, and it was Manuel Keane when he was the curator here, um, we had been to Trier Cathedral in Germany. I'd found a book, and there was a, just a tiny little one line that said there were three hairs on the bottom of this casket. There was a photograph, but no matter how hard you looked, you could not see it. So we thought the only thing to do was to go to Trier Cathedral and actually have a look and, and, and see, see for ourselves. And the, the, the upper part of it is, ju is just lovely, lovely um, uh, gilded work. It's, it's absolutely um, wonderful 
filigree work. Um, but the bottom, the base plate, is where we find our hairs. And here's the base plate, um, lots of scrolling foliage, and creatures that you often do find in the art of the Islamic world. You've got griffins here, and sphinxes up there, and bicorporate lions, lions with two uh, bodies sharing one head here. And here you would have had hairs, and here you still do have hairs. And squ squashed into position, not running in a circle here, but, you know, in a position of prominence on the bottom of this base plate. And here's a detail to make it easier to see. <laughs> but this was actually black. It was, we, don't know how, we don't know how it came to the cathedral. Um, we do know that in 1655 it housed part of the skull of St. Uh, Lazarus, who was the patron saint of lepers. Um, and uh, because that's documented, there's a drawing of this casket in 1655 in the cathedral um, treasury at Trier. Um, so we know it was there then, but, but later on I think it, it was sort of almost ignored and it, it, was, bl it was completely black until it was cleaned and, and this, this wonderful work was revealed. But how it came to the cathedral, we've just got no idea. And we asked the, the curator of the treasury there and he said, we just don't, you know, there's no history, we don't know, we just don't know. So, um, a silver bowl, 14th century from the Iranian world, um, in the Al-Saba collection. And again, the hairs marching around um, in their circle. And quite a late occurrence, I think, for the, the, the design. Um, almost the, the latest, I think, that we know, as far as I, I'm aware, the latest that we know of the design um, in the Iranian world. And so we have our hairs here in all these different contexts. Uh, we have the Buddhist context from, um, well, 581 to 618 um, AD. And then we travel through the Islamic world, into the Christian world, and then into uh, Judaism as well. So these hairs have, have crossed cultures. They brought peoples together. And um, it's a, a, a motif that's been described as humble and yet haunting. And it is. It, it doesn't shout. It's a quiet sort of motif. And yet it's run through all these different cultures over this huge period of time. And it has a post-medieval life as well. This is a silver-plated pillbox that I have in, uh, at home um, from about 1900, uh, made in France. And it's based on the hairs that are underneath the balcony of Cardinal, uh, the house of Cardinal Jouffroy in luxeuil les bains in France, in eastern France. And it's just a, a little small thing, probably made about 1900, um, and silver on brass. And a lusterware plate um, made in 2014 by Jonathan Carswell Jones in Sussex in England. And he's using techniques that were developed in this part of the world, lusterware, um, in a very modern way, using um, traditional, some traditional designs. He um, really likes the, the art of the Islamic world and, and likes to use the designs. Um, and I think it's just such a wonderful modern interpretation of the design. So I'd like to finish on this image. Um, the three hairs is back to where we started. We've come full circle, back to the three hairs here in Kuwait. And the motif rests upon the fact that the animals share. They share their ears at the center of the design. But for me, and for the, for the owner actually perhaps of this tray, it may have been that the inscriptions, the, the benedictions on this bowl, were more important than the hare's image itself. But for me, the hare's image will always um, have a fa an endless fascination because it's brought people together and its bridge divides and it talks about what we share. It talks about what we share in, in the way of a sort of deep feeling for art and design and for fine craftsmanship. Um, and it occurs, as I say, in all these different cultures, but certainly at the heart of it, the transmission of the design, I'm sure, was because of the technical accomplishments in the Islamic world that enabled these fine, fine pieces, and people wanted them. And people wanted the metalwork, they wanted the textiles, and because they wanted them, that's how come the motif has moved across continents and cultures. Thank you.